part two of Alexei Rostovich's interview to Evgeny Kiselov. Main topic is demand for changing of an old corrupt system in Ukraine, and demand has been increasing. Irina Barkova asking me, ain't I'm ashamed for conversing with Alexei Rostovich? I'm not ashamed, I am curious. This is a very specific Ukrainian agenda, Evgeny. In the last three weeks, I gave about 10 interviews to the leading media in the world. They're not ashamed. But what is her name? Yelena Barkova, who probably lives somewhere in Ukraine or in Russia. Yeah, we don't know where she lives, but she, she did not indicate. Right, and for her it's uh, shameful, apparently. You know, Irina, me and Evgeny were entertaining the question whether we should prefer your opinion about how to live and what to do, or to prefer our own opinion on that regard. And after very difficult choices, we have chosen to live the way we like to live and not the way you want us to live. Exactly. So, tell me still, if to presume that right now the West will provide Ukraine much larger aid than it did provide before. If Ukrainian military would acquire a lot of jets, tanks, missiles with a longer range from Atacom's nomenclature, now there are some news coming out that there are already some longer range missiles being uh, supplied to Ukraine for HIMARS systems, more um, radio-electronic interference and radio-electronic warfare equipment, you think Ukrainian military still would not be able to achieve a drastic success on the front? No, that's impossible, or rather very difficult. Please explain. Here's the problem, Evgeny. Supplying equipment and preparing our troops to use it is about nine months cycle. Even if they start supplying us three brigades worth equipment, which is impossible, but imagine they will start supplying three sets uh, for three brigades uh, every month. But if you remember, after our Kherson operation, to the next attempt when we actually accumulated enough effort for the counteroffensive, it was about seven to nine months. So we will be preparing and we'll be getting ready, right? What will Russians be doing in the meantime? They will be digging more lines. Now they're digging already the fourth line on the defense. By the time we'll be ready to start this offensive, they'll have nine of those. And no Atacams or anything else will allow us to effectively move through it. We will cause a lot of damage and a lot of casualties among the occupants, but it would still be very difficult task to liberate occupied territories, because landmine is a very simple device. It's not a tank, it costs much less to build. So Russia could get a ton of those in North Korea and would just saturate the whole front line with them. And it'll be very difficult for us to move with all that hardware in the ground. Atacams can effectively destroy the most valuable targets, warehouses, command outposts, and the like. Same things you can do with F-16s. F-16s can also push Russian aviation from the front line. But still, everything will be decided in the trench, where two infantry men are fighting at the distance of the grenade throw. And it's very difficult to produce a high-qualified infantry, storm infantry, in six months. It's doable, but it's very difficult. One would need to change the recruiting rules, you need to change the training, you need storm troopers that will be able to work just like a third special brigade Azov Detachment of a National Guard for 5th Brigade. Those can fight, highly motivated infantrymen, those who can go to the field filled with landmines, jump into the enemy's trench and fight with them on the pistol distance. But you need to have a lot of them. Ability of Ukraine as a country with a very poor administration on all levels, including military administration, because military education and preparation definitely has room for improvement. So, in order to change the situation on the front, you'd need three army corps, or better, four or five. It is absolutely impossible to obtain them with the current system that we have in Ukraine. We just won't be able to find motivated fighters like that. And to build those 
out of the unmotivated fighters, one would need a very different training system that will turn those people who are fleeing from recruitment into the wolves who are ready to fight with Wagner troops and with Russian paratroopers in the trenches. We definitely do not have this know-how. So regardless of how much of the Western arms we'll get, and we won't even get them, it's still an unsolvable task. Why do you say we won't get them? Well, first of all, Europe doesn't have it. They promised to give us a million shells, artillery shells. This was a program voted unanimously on the level of European Commission, and they managed to provide only 300,000. They don't have technical capacity, and they will not get that capacity in the near time term. The contracts for delivery are, you're looking at 24, 25 year. In the meantime, Russia acquired a million shells from North Korea. Then you take the only country which could provide such a flow of arms, that would be United States of America. They have it, but they have gaps in nomenclature. For example, shells. And they could give us tanks, but there would not be enough replacement spare parts and not enough for shells for the tanks shooting. Um, you know, many people are also looking at the number of arms America stockpiles on the open yards somewhere in Nevada, in the desert. But there are military experts, and I don't know how much we should listen to them, which uh, still are saying that all that equipment is conserved and it's not exactly usable. One would need to bring it back, refit it, reservice it, and there's no guarantee that all of them will be working well. Yes, uh, getting it from reserved state, uh, from stored condition, it's not a banal task. Especially when you're talking not about hammer or tank, uh, but uh, about F-16 or anything complex, more complex than that. So, Americans also fell for that Fukuyama statement, who decided that uh, the, it's the end of the history and there'll be no huge wars like uh, Second World War and Iran-Iraq War, and Americans were preparing for small partisan-style wars. And a good example, for example, Merkel, when she took reign of Germany, they had 26 brigades. When she left, they had barely functioning six brigades. It was normal for German army to be buying tanks without spare parts. So formally, they would have tanks, but they would not have any spare parts. And after, if there's a conflict, after a month of use of these tanks, they would be out of water because there'd be nothing to repair it with. So imagine Americans would still be able to provide some arms if they really tried, but they're not. Because one of the topics there is problematizing aid to Ukraine, both financial and military, because they don't have an answer why, and we're not answering this question. Well, how do you mean? Just to hold Russian expansion, right? Is that not good enough of an answer? Because Russia, as many people in the West are saying, it starts to represent existential threat to democratic civilization. Right, but there is a nuance. Biden's administration, in my opinion, what I can see looking at it and conversing with people, the dominating position is Kissinger doctrine, triangle, Moscow, Beijing, Washington. And two tops of this triangle have to be on one of the, one of the other tops has to be with Washington. So previously they had Beijing together with Washington. Now they want Russia, if not on the side of Washington, but at least to be neutral. So their main mathematics is to make sure the nuclear threat does not join together China and Russia against the United States. That's the hugest headache for them. When Putin visited Xi Jinping in China, Congress published a research about American capability of conducting nuclear warfare against Russia and China simultaneously. And Sullivan is a representative of that position. So they're working on Russia to prevent it from going under China. And from their point of view, the main reason for it to go under China would be a military defeat, an utter defeat in Ukraine. Then Russia becomes a satellite of China and not a simple satellite, but a nuclear and a resource satellite. They are rather concerned with that possibility, and mathematics is definitely not in their favor right now. So the mood in Biden's administration still dictates Russia should not win, Ukraine should not lose. 
translating it to simple words, Biden administration is against utter destruction of Russian troops on the battlefront in Ukraine. They consider this option to be dangerous. So until administration is changed, or until their approach changes, nothing will uh, change there as well. It is election year, and by the way, they're still voting for aid to Ukraine, and they're not going to vote it in December likely, so probably it will be end of January, and that would mean, you know what, that means Ukraine will have to uncork its gold reserves to support us financially. And do you think European Union that announced another tranche of 1.5 billion euros, um, yeah, it will help. It will generally help to probably continue paying social payments and maybe stabilize the course of Hrivna. But you cannot load euros in the artillery systems. You need shells, and you don't have enough shells. Listen here, a listener with the nickname Beer Torpedo. Very imaginative person, I suspect. Yeah, very respectable uh, voice. We cannot ignore him. At least he has some fantasy in uh, selecting his nicks. If Aristovich becomes a president of Ukraine, he's asking it a tenth time, will he be able to make friends with Putin and Russia? Make friends? No. Build relations in regards to building new security system in Europe? I think yes. What could you offer him? I have something to offer. Uh, for example, I would suggest let's analyze the reasons that brought us to this war. And I would ask uh, their side how he would see compensating for these reasons. So that Russia would not see any threat to its uh, regime, to its territory from outside. And we could look for solutions then. If you remember, I was a participant of Istanbul negotiations and I was leading the military subgroup, one of those four that was there. And I went uh, throughout through the whole Istanbul document from the beginning to an end. And I understand that, first of all, in Russia, there are people who are ready to agree for truce on mutually beneficial conditions, and they're ready to consider national interests of Ukraine. By the way, Putin today stated just that in his speech. Second thing, I know how they are concerned with the strains, not with the moral side of it, but with the strains it creates in the Russian society. In their internal kitchen, don't ask me where I know it from, they have a time frame of maybe a year, year and a half, after which as they state themselves, they'll start losing ability to control situation in Russia. And they likely will be mutiny internally. So they are in a rather difficult position. And this is a war of one armed with one legged. Neither side can fully prevail in this war. And they understand that at some point they need to stop. But they need to understand the conditions of which, uh, under which it will happen. They need to understand what they will get from it and how much safety will it provide them. We can laugh at them. But no country of the world can afford themselves to not think about their national security. Everybody is from Guatemala to United States to China to Russia. They have certain concerns. I know them by heart because I served for three years in the trilateral group, a Norman, Normandy format for two years. But I think I have what uh, to answer, what answers to give them to their concerns. Do you understand that most of these concerns are completely phantom? Yes, that's very true, and I understand them rather keenly, because I feel their spiritual, if you want to say, aspect of this uh, position from afar. They need to be assured that nobody is looking to seize their natural resources that are so far away from warm ports of Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. Right, it's much easier to purchase goods than hunt them down and take them away from somebody which all the modern history suggests. See, just in a couple of minutes, we already found a good su suggestion for them. But if you conduct serious negotiations when everything is put on the table and you remove ideological component from both sides, and it's usually a mutual process, then one can speak on the level of pragmatism. But these negotiations can happen only when a certain guarantees are provided, for example, from the same G7. So we cannot afford the situation when these negotiations, when we don't have some guarantees going in. 
and then they become unfeasible. But uh, after that, there are different mechanisms, and I don't want to voice them, but it's basically technical elements. For every argument, there is a bunch of data points that can be brought, and it's tactical negotiations. What I'm talking about is that Russia has its uh, legit national interests. They, of course, have a huge ideological phantom inflated by Putin's administration. This phantom is not real, not uh, it's not a reality, and the whole waging of this war was proving them that uh, this phantom is far from being real as it was trumpeted. So in order uh, to conduct negotiations, they already start to understand that they need to happen on the level not of who is a fascist here, but uh, let's discuss our national interests. These negotiations with certain guarantees can have success because the war also heats up their society, their country. It brings their physical security to risk. Do they understand that, you think? Uh, yeah, they do understand that. Internally, that's definitely, uh, the, the risks are increasing. Many observers, Alexei, are now stating that in Russia, the radical wing that wants a victorious war to the very end has strengthened much. Um, this uh, victorious end may happen sooner than they want for them and not in the way they think. For example, right now we have the parts of four armies from Russian side fighting near Avdiivka. And from military point of view, the configuration of the front line, I cannot remember a history, a military history, where somebody succeeded in holding and defending such an outpost in that configuration. They're taking a third, making a third attempt of taking Avdiivka. They've wasted more equipment in a month than they produce in a year. So such war has no perspective for them. And sorry, I just read in the newspaper Wall Street Journal today, and Bild was also publishing it, that Russian motion near Avdiivka continues at a very small pace, but at the cost of huge losses that are estimated to be 20 to 1. And there is an organization, Oryx, that is conducting the analysis of losses based on the photo and video information that can be obtained. And just according to their limited data, the losses of Russian side are at least five times more than Ukrainian side. Right. So look here, the concentration of means and tools, the previous one, which was uh, happening from January to August of 23, and ended with uh, Solidar being taken and Bakhmut being taken with huge losses, and they even used the Bakhmut. So all that effort led them to take one regional center. Now they've been aggregating forces uh, from February of 23 to October of 23. They started taking Avdivka, and they still haven't taken it. Uh, so you can analytically say that it takes them six to nine months to create enough surplus for another offensive after their cautery military was burnt at the beginning of this war. With this tempo, this war will finish off Russian Federation much sooner and their regime much sooner than they even take Slavyansk and Kramatorsk if they want to add the whole of Donetsk and Lugansk regions to whatever they occupied. So look, one regional center on average every six to nine months with huge losses. It's horrible uh, pro proposition to continue the war like that. You can have your military industrial complex working 24 seven, you can buy FPV drones and other things, but it still is an infantry man who is winning on the ground. Now they have a problem. The Akatra military is gone. They all died at the beginning of this war. And sergeants and lieutenants, the ones who usually transfer the battle experience, they don't have enough of them because they're the ones usually teaching the new cadre and new recruits and they don't live long enough. So it's difficult. And they're very bad at conducting joint operations between uh, aviation and ground forces and artillery. So I'm listening to you and I'm saying, well, then we should uh, go into offensive and start de defeating that army, right? No, problem is we're in the same position and they have a bigger potential. And as Zaluzhny highlighted in his article, the fight of potentials will end not in our favor because we are smaller. If we were three times more organized and better technically equipped, then yes, a small modern 
a very bitey army could probably bite a lot of chunks out of the big Russian type army. But since there are two armies fighting at about the same development level, then we're facing the battle of potentials, which is not in our favor from the get-go. We can push the Steinosaur to start swaying and explode from within, but nobody can guarantee that. But that would be at a price of Paraguayization of this warfare. I don't know if our listeners uh, know of that. Paraguay was uh, waging a war in 19th century, and they ended it rather successfully, um, fighting uh, simultaneously with three countries, but suffered such huge losses in man population and in industry that they even allowed uh, to have multiple wives for their um, families. And it's been a hundred years over that, and they're still trying to recover. There's still things that are uh, lagging behind. Are we ready to pay such a price to lose 250 more thousand Ukrainians and maybe half a million wounded? So, okay, then what if uh, Russian military do take Avdiivka? It will not change anything principally. It'll just uh, sharpen the discussion and the voices of those who are saying that we are in a strategic stalemate they will start to be heard. They'll start to get more support. And they'll also be gathering more curses after Avdiivka from those who would still believe uh, that we'll get to the borders of 1991 in just a couple of days or weeks. A few more questions or statements from our listeners. Several people are asking, one of them, for example, who calls himself Destro, don't know how to read it right. Do you believe, Alexei Nikolaevich, that Putin has died and now Russia is being managed by its double? No, I do not believe in that. I do not think that Xi Jinping would allow himself to shake hand with a double. And what do you think about uh, statements of Professor Solovey and the Telegram channel called General SVR. Do you think they work to support the interests of power in Russia or they are digging against the legitimacy of uh, people in power, stating that Putin is in the refrigerator, the Putin on the TV is not real and it's just a double? I think it's difficult to calculate anti-Putin and pro-Putin consequences of that behavior. So we can consider that they're probably doing their own information politics on the level of cringe, and uh, very often their statements are being defamed, denounced by real, fact, real facts, real events. And uh, speaking of their motivation, it's difficult to explain why, because some of that, what they say, actually does damage Putin's regime. On the other hand, some of the other statements can also legitimize him, because, for example, all the talks about Putin's death will only now call upon laughter, oh, again, right, like the kid who cried wolf so many times. So it's difficult to calculate their exact benefit for or against. Somebody else is asking, why do we need Aristovich today? The person has discredited himself, who is listening to him? Listen, we have three and a half thousand people watching that simultaneously, live stream. This is a rather big audience for such a conversation. Listen, Evgeny, there is one very logic fact. We are not coming to the video of this gentleman, you and I, and do not write statements, uh, who needs you? He comes to us. So, it's very easy to determine the importance of the event by the fact who came to whom. That's true, that's true, Alexei. So, you did mention Xi Jinping of China. How would you comment on the event that uh, both Biden and Xi Jinping refused to participate in G20 virtually? They've met recently, and their agendas are so different, and they're so different from the agenda of G20 that they probably consider their participation not to any effect. Or, which is also likely, they're still reflecting upon their bilateral meeting, and they're not ready yet to come with official statements to G20 until they formulate some statement because they probably exchanged some ideas and proposals and they're discussing them now. And G20, your statement on G20 has to be substantiative, right? You need to say about, talk about something, something factual. 
And when a person of that caliber talks about nothing, it is always uh, seen as a bad tone. So it's um, smarter for them to refuse to speak because uh, coming with a weak speech can actually negatively affect a lot of things, including stock markets and all. For figures of Biden and Xi caliber, they always need to be bringing something new to the table and pushing it somewhere. Otherwise, the, they're risking crushing the existing balance and causing more anxiety. All right. So there is another statement that politics is the art of possible. And it's considered that it is impossible to go in politics against the mass moods of electors, of your electorate. It's very difficult to ignore. From that point of view, do you think one can ignore that majority of Ukrainian citizens are categorically not ready to listen to a suggestion of any negotiations and territorial concessions with Russia? About 29% are for negotiations. A small uh, additional percent number is uh, ready to listen. So 29, 24%, depending upon the region, are ready for negotiations. And another part of Ukrainian society is uh, skeptically ready to listen. So roughly, it's only slightly above 50% that are vehemently against it. But moods change. All right. So what would be then on the table of negotiations? Many people on the West are saying that they don't see readiness from Russian side to negotiate, and they don't have any factual things we can bring to the table. Let's go with Putin today. He made a statement. Let me find it. He was there at uh, online G20 summit. He said that Russia never refused from peace talks in Ukraine. The war is, of course, devastating, but it's devastating for civilians. We need to think how to stop this tragedy, the war in Ukraine. So that is his statement for G20, which is there for a reason, which was voiced there for a reason. So they are showing some signals. It's more of a question about the trusting authorities. If Zelensky, a day and a half before the statement by Putin, was saying that he's ready to assassinate Putin, that it would be very difficult for them to meet at the table. Why it is a bad tone to attack ad hominem your opponent as much as you hate him. Because you're basically maybe satisfying your emotions, but you are limiting your strategic options. And the art of strategy is in expanding the options and the space of options for yourself, or at least not to shrink it. A politician of a high caliber should not be making decisions and steps that do limit his strategic field, unless he is sure that he can win and has means and opportunities to carry it through. So before you threaten somebody with annihilation or murder, you must be sure that you can. When Churchill and Roosevelt met in Casablanca, and they talked about the end goal of this war to be a capitulation of Germany and uh, the need to collaborate, they were realistically evaluating their potential and they understood that they can solve this task in the perspective. That's why they were providing aid to Stalin and three biggest economies of the world spent quite a bit of an effort kicking uh, Third Reich down and they lost a few people too. And uh, they still set the goals looking at the problem realistically. And when one makes a statement, yeah, we will assassinate Putin, but do we have this technical capability? What do these statements lead to? Do they defuse the situation in Ukraine internationally? Do they create any new opportunities for you? Have you seen the statement by Zelensky that he is eager to discuss uh, politics with Trump? Right, yeah, I heard that. President Zelensky started sending signals that in general he might consider negotiations. But first, Russia needs to withdraw their troops, and then second, third, and fourth conditions. But even he is sending signals that, in general, somewhere in the perspective, we can negotiate. So it's more of a context of these negotiations, its contents and conditions. Because if both sides will come inflated with ideologists to the table, 
These negotiations will be doomed from the beginning. We'll kill you, you're fascist, you never existed. That would get you nowhere. You need to change your logic to pragmatism. You have concerns? Okay, we also have concerns. Let's discuss what are we worried about. I ask you about this because I had a thought. Isn't it too early for President of Ukraine to send such a signal that he is ready to talk to to talk with Trump? Because in the United States, the election campaign is only starting, and Zelensky is actually making a good gesture towards Trump and not a good gesture towards an acting President Biden. And that's true. But by the way, two or three days ago on Biden's holiday birthday, Trump started leading as a presidential candidate among all the layers of society. For the first time, he scored more pro votes than Biden in such a poll. And Zelensky, I think, could be reacting to that signal. And Trump is making large steps. Court allowed him to participate in the elections. Uh, wait. I think, as far as I know, the court just made a statement that this old 14th Amendment that was taken after the civil war between North and South is not to be applicable towards Trump. Many people consider that to be a situation when support of voters can deform judicial field in a positive way so that uh, Trump actually does get a chance to be running for presidential office. Because we understand, if he has about 80% voters for him, then no court will ever be able to cancel his run. And public poll, public opinion, was the first day when Trump actually gathered more pro-votes than Biden in the polling. So maybe our administration sent that signal. Um, another question from No Little on the Moon. That's an interesting nick. And yeah, he is misspelling my last name. I'm Kiselov. Please write it correctly next time. But uh, he's stating that you're making very different statements here than uh, yesterday with Romanenko. And supposedly you haven't seen anything positive for Ukraine yesterday. Well, I don't see still anything positive for Ukraine in its current frame, its current period, due to the way it is being administered and the logic that runs our upper political hierarchy. It tells me that they're at the end of their competence and that usually ends real badly for systems and processes. So let's maybe be more precise. I do not see anything good for the team in charge. There are still perspectives for Ukraine, though. Ukraine is a very big country and society to be just sentenced uh, summarily. But because of ill competence of those who manage this country and our resources on different levels, I'm 99% sure we're going to face significant turbulations in the future, in the near future. Dr. Dent is asking a question, what will Aristovich do when Russia wins? Russia will not win. It cannot, technically. This war is very clearly in a strategic stalemate. Neither we can win, nor they can win. So I have no fears of Ukraine losing in the format that Russian troops will be everywhere up to Lvov and they would capture Kiev. But that we are taking away our future perspectives at this moment cutting the options for our development are very good options. This is what worries me a lot. Recently you made a post about three scenarios in 2024 and they all look bad for Ukraine. Do you still think so? There is not a single good scenario? Yeah, I do not see any positive scenarios for Ukraine in 2024 in the logic of extrapolation unless there'll be some black swans, gray rhinos, uh, wicked-colored dinosaurs, uh, maybe that uh, may work. For example, Putin all of a sudden dies, right? They would change uh, the structure of events, but you cannot use that. You cannot you could not rely on these uh, events as the element of planning. You cannot put in your defense plan 
pour into federal budget the death of Putin as a factor. All right, what do you expect from the events unfolding in Russia then? Well, let's imagine they have elections in spring, that Putin needs to legitimize his position that was uh, slowly crumbling, which forces him to certain voluntary limitations, like not conducting mass mobilization in Russia, that still make him throw some money into the economy to pretend that it's living the life in Russia is not too bad. What happens after? I think Putin will continue running situation or provide exert effective control of Russian Federation at least till the elections in the United States. Most likely for spring they are preparing serious offensive on one of the parts of the front. Some signs indicate that. And we will have to deal with that he'll be fighting for some social politics in the meantime. And there'll be some elections locally as well, so it's not just Putin, it's also congressmen there and local authorities. So they'll be changing a little bit, maybe, some of the government. And after that, as usual, there'll be some unpopular decisions made. I don't know if mobilization of economy or like total war mobilization like Patrushev dropped recently, but they would likely implement certain measures to increase their control over economy and over society and army, they will probably do that using that uh, refreshed legitimacy and they will incre try to increase their position to be stronger on the future negotiations. That's what we were trying to do. If we managed to reach Crimea, the mouth of Crimea in our counteroffensive, we would have been at a very strong position to negotiate. So they will try to push for something like that as well. Uh, how much will they succeed? That's still a big question. Uh, but right now, the balance of powers is at a stalemate. They are still just trying to increase to better their position. Tell me, please, what is your attitude towards uh, General Zaluzhny? A question from same, knowing nothing on the moon. How do you gauge his figure? I mean, personally, would you compare him to Khmelnytsky, Petlura, or Skoropatsky? We have been good friends with him for 29 years. Oh. Yeah, we're from the same military school. He is one year older than me. We fought together in Donbass. Well, he was a head of command of uh, the whole operation. I was aide to the head of the command, and we worked a lot and we intersected a lot. So our relations are friendly, good friendly relations. As for his military qualities, I think he is an outstanding leader, outstanding specialist. If he had higher level of control over things, our results would have been better. I would remind once again that his position is mentioned only twice in our legal documents in Ukraine. So his position was uh, created, but it was never written out properly in the legislative documents. Our deputies in parliament are doing all kinds of shenanigans instead of formalizing and giving larger authority to commander-in-chief and to define the differences between presidential power and commander-in-chief. So he has to work basically at his own authority without having anything to rely upon in the legal sphere. It's been almost two years of war, nothing changed. What the heck our Congress is doing besides uh, some of them spewing that Aristovich need to be put in prison. So he's limited in his capacity. He is being uh, binded and he cannot shine, he's uh, precluded from really shining in what he can do. There are a lot of accusations that there's a lot of lack of order in uh, our military, but that starts with, and I can talk about that a lot, it starts with changing the legal system in regards to military. So to cancel a lot of paperwork, for example, that exists still in the military, you need to change the legal framework. And this is what our Congress should be working on. But instead, they're making some populist statements like celebrating Man's Day or removal of monuments to Pushkin instead of actually fortifying the legal system in terms of our defense structure and give proper tools for Zaluzhny and the like to carry out their tasks. Do you understand? So, Skaropatsky, Petlura or Khmelnytsky? 
No, Zaluzhny is Zaluzhny. I wouldn't compare him with other uh, figures historically in Ukraine uh, with all desire to compare today's situation with 1918. The situation is still unique. There are some similarities, but it's very different. The words of Zelensky that military should not be interfering in politics, is it a confirmation of the conflict between the commander-in-chief and superior commander-in-chief? So let's define what is a conflict. When commander-in-chief is stating that we are at a strategic stalemate and superior commander a week later makes a statement that no, we can still continue our counteroffensive. This is a conflict taken out into the public sphere. These are diametrically opposite points of view brought out into the public sphere. So this is not a personal conflict. This is not an apparatus conflict. This is a conflict of visions that is uh, brought out in the public that needs to be resolved somehow. So, Alexei, some people, not uh, I'm not talking about the interview, I'm talking about the article that Economist was published as a list of demands or needs that would allow Ukrainian military to get out of the strategic stalemate. Well, yes, but at first he did conclude that we are at a stalemate, and then he was highlighting options that we need in order to get out of it, because we're also in scientific technical stalemate. The same they had in the First World War until the tanks were invented, when neither side could do anything to capture enemy trenches and territory without um, any new technology. Military cannot, uh, do not have a technology to do that now. So he's showing that, he's highlighting that we do not have these tools. And President is saying, no, with what we have, we can continue. It's the same as if the right pilot would say, we can still fly, we don't need, uh, or actually the other way, the, the right pilot would say that we need uh, an emergency landing, and then commander of the vessel would say, no, we're flying okay, we continue. So this is a conflict, and we're not even, we don't even need to talk about some hidden conflicts and all. This is definitely a conflict of position. And on the date of Maidan, uh, President made another two statements that the third Maidan is being prepared to topple him, and he also made a statement that military should not be going into politics. So he is protecting his own power. And I have a question. Is it a good time to protect your power when your government is totally ineffective? I have a question to you. Do you think that Russia can organize, or Putin or Kremlin can organize the Third Maidan? Absolutely not. They lost all the levers uh, they had in our society. Our counter intel destroyed a lot of those that they had before. And it's naive to think that some sleeping agents can organize the event, the level of Maidan, with the martial law currently in effect in the country. This is unachievable. And Maidan was never organized by anybody. It was always a self-organized event by citizens. Half the world is helping Ukraine. But counteroffensive has failed. What are the perspectives? If the aid flutters, Ukraine will cease to exist. A question from Andrew from Siberia. No, uh, aid will not be fully removed, but the position of the world now is that Ukraine should not lose, Russia should not win. And that's uh, the consensus, until at least the Biden administration changes in the White House. And if it changes, well, many things can happen. Um, we don't know how Trump will behave himself. In this regard, I'm not too pessimistic, by the way, uh, unlike many others, because observing after his first term, it uh, shows that uh, he's ready for different solutions. Of course, he's a businessman, so you try to agree, but if he is not listened to, he is capable of making some rather drastic movements. All right. Alexei, we're being thanked for this dialogue. We've been live for almost an hour and a half. We have about 5,000 watching us live. And let's uh, limit this good dessert, right? Um, yeah, I have to run as well for another event, and we'll meet with you in two weeks again, right? Yes, I do hope so, and I do hope that it's not the last. Of course, yeah, I already told my viewers that at least once a month I will 
with your permission, try to talk to you and to your audience. All right, thank you, all those who were watching us. And right after this live stream, you can watch this dialogue recorded on my channel, on Alexei Arstovich's channel. And if you are watching that in English, it was Privateer Station that brought it to you. Please do not forget to subscribe, to click the like button. If you have more questions, you can write them under this stream. We will transfer them to Alexei to answer. And all the good, all the best to everybody. Thank you, dear viewers, and for attention and for the questions. Goodbye.